I have a real soft spot for cyberpunk as a genre. That's not totally accurate. I have a soft spot for tiny spiders and little raccoons. I have an obsession with cyberpunk as a genre. And I've had to play it cool for a little while, had to keep that one close to the chest so that you would all think that I'm a totally normal, high-functioning human being, that I don't think about neon lights and corpo greed and bodily augmentation all the time, always. I didn't want my place here on YouTube to become too defined by the title that started this all, or the genre in general, but now, now you see, I've made enough videos on other things that are also really cool so that I can succumb to my obsession once more. I can drag you down into this hole with me, and I can disguise it all as some sort of genre dissection, an adventure into the world of small titles, and I can tell you that it's an exploration of the use of themes and genre, but we all know all I've ever wanted to do is just talk about cyberpunk, baby! Let's go! Okay, let's bring it back down to 11 and talk about what the hell we're actually doing here. My obsession with cyberpunk runs pretty deep, but it also runs pretty narrow. It pretty much developed entirely off the back of CD Projekt Red's 2020 release Cyberpunk 2077 and the accompanying anime spin-off, Cyberpunk Edgerunners. And since then, I've played around a bit and I've picked up titles like Cloudpunk that really play well in the space of neon lights in towering cities, or something like Robocop Rogue City, which plays more to the tune of mechanical and biological augmentations in human identity, but I've decided I want more. I want to understand the genre itself, and how it's used in this interactive medium. So I found three games, because three is a good number, that are all presented and sold as cyberpunk experiences, and I want to really think about what that cyberpunk tag is doing in all of these, starting with Sanabi. It was this shot, right here, that made my brain-body combination do the thing with the credit card where I went from not owning Sanabi to owning Sanabi with no conscious or present thought in between. And so it was to my surprise and confusion when the opening shot of the game placed me asleep under the cool shade of a cherry tree on a small hill in a vast green valley. It was also why my stomach got tight the moment I saw that I had a daughter. Cyberpunk as a genre does this really interesting thing in regards to people wherein it largely beats the shit out of them, making any sort of genuine human connection a deeply trepidatious event, and it feels like Sanabi knows this because they make the daughter almost offensively cute. In a vacuum, it's one of my favorite openings for a game, the kind of thing where you could just give me an entire story of these two. No stakes, no conflict, just two characters having a life together. In context, however, it remains one of my favorite openings for a story because I am playing a cyberpunk game and I know what that means. It means that every moment I spend in this valley with my daughter gets that knot in my stomach tighter and tighter because it's obvious what's coming. It's obvious that you are some retired military personnel. It is obvious that you've had some form of cybernetic enhancement during your career, and because you still have those enhancements in your retirement, it's obvious that you will have to use them again. That part of the story begins when your daughter calls from your home using a walkie-talkie to ask about the funny clock that's now in the house. The clock is funny, she says, because it has Sanabi written on it, and the time is going backwards. You are too late by the time you make it back. A bomb meant for you has instead taken everything from you. It's an event that drags you back into your old life, working as a general within the military in pursuit of that titular Sanabi with only one real lead. Mago City, a cyberpunk dystopia owned entirely by the Mago Group. And at the tallest peak of the highest corporate tower, Sanabi is waiting for you. If it were that simple, that would be fine, but there's a sort of intersecting crossroad in the stories here, because just a few hours before we begin our journey to Mago City, the city went totally dark. In the blink of an eye, three million people have disappeared, and Mago, alongside Sanabi, are the only people who could be responsible. The military has tried to send in people to investigate, but no one has returned, and there's only one survivor that we can identify from those teams, a hacker and engineer sent to the city with one of the teams, named Mari. Mari has sent out a distress call, saying that she found answers the military will want to know, and because we're the only person in the military who's met Sanabi before, we're sent into Mago with a twofold objective. Find Mari, and find Sanabi. Things fall apart pretty quick though, because after finding Mari, she reveals that she has no answers at all. She lied, because she knew it would be the only way that the military would send help. Try not to hold it against her, she's probably right. Mari is a fascinating foil for our character, the General. Young girl, and old man, a grizzled war veteran, and a cheery hacker. 
Both of these characters rely heavily on tech to find their strength between the General's chain arm and Mari's robot companion Muffin, which is another foil, direct versus indirect, in regards to how these characters deal with the world around them. The one similarity they do have is that they're both looking for Sanabi, because Sanabi killed Mari's father just like they killed our daughter. Again, a natural foil, but also a very distinct and natural hook for characters in a cyberpunk game. Loss and revenge are pretty basic components of this genre, mostly because the cyberpunk dystopia is inherently linked to low quality of life, with a clear sense of tragedy and devaluing of human existence, which creates a sort of cycle by which terrible things occur, characters react to those things, and then more terrible things happen to them and the people around them via those reactions. It's a loop, and it's perhaps the most important definer when it comes to making a story or a setting cyberpunk, and it's brought both us and Mari to Mago City. Our journey through the world of Mago City takes us through perhaps four or five distinct different areas, each made up of a number of smaller, traversable maps, and this is when we get to perhaps the only element of a cyberpunk world more valuable than its tone, its design. There are three main elements to Mago City, each pulling from different elements of cyberpunk design. The first of these, in the outskirts and lower city, is a brutal sense of poverty and degradation. These are the areas that have been deemed non-profitable by the corp that owns Mago City, and so it simply ignores them. There are a scant few tastes of the expected neon glow in the lower city, but mostly you will see it through the wreckages and the slums. It is in the middle city that we will see what I consider the truest form of cyberpunk aesthetic. These lights are ads, but they're so dense and so bright that it leaves them almost entirely illegible. The idea of recognizing any individual project in the shine of this city is comical, and that's okay, because at this density, the lights aren't trying to sell you a product, they're trying to sell you the city. How could anything dark happen in a world so bright? The highest level of the city is where the Mago group and Sanabi reside, and it's dressed in all the fineries you would expect from the wealthiest areas of a cyberpunk world. This stereotypical Neo-Japan architecture, the towering skyscrapers that finely pierce through the clouds, and the soft cherry blossom pink that defines the color scheme of the upper city. It is quite literally the height of luxury, quite literally built atop the entire working class below it. I spoke briefly in my Cloudpunk video about height and elevation as elements of class divide, accentuated especially in the cyberpunk genre, and this is another incredible showcase of that. Through my journey higher and higher into Mago City, however, I started to feel like I was missing something. Mari was focused on Sanabi too, that made sense, but it felt like we were experiencing two different forms of the same city. Anytime the general would ask about the missing people, or comment on what could have possibly made three million people vanish instantly, Mari would respond with what I understood to be total apathy. Zero regard for what we were saying, almost like it didn't make sense. And I took this to be evidence of her total focus on reaching Sanabi, the consequence of a one-track mind and a hyper-focused mentality. But it was also where I started to get confused about what was going on. There is so much ambiguity in the story of Sanabi, and despite there being a cutscene and conversation at the end of basically every map, it felt like the conversations just went in circles, that every step forward was one step back, even the general at multiple points had to demand that Mari stop beating around the bush with what she's talking about. Conversations would veer dramatically and always seem to cut off right before a reveal. One of the great mysteries of the game is that of the Maga group, because after the disappearance of the whole city, They've put a sort of doomsday protocol into effect. They've purposely begun the process of manually forcing a meltdown of the city's nuclear reactor, putting us on a timer and giving us a secondary objective. Try and prevent one of the greatest nuclear disasters of all time. But why they would do this remained unclear for most of the game. The behavior of Mari also baffled me at times. More than once, she would pull a harmonica from her pocket and demand that I play it. Her father used to play it, and while it's sad that she lost him, there's nothing I could do to fix that. At a certain point in the story, she seemingly suffers a complete mental break, after her robot companion Muffin is broken in a fall, during which the general had to make the call on which of the two to save, he remarks to her that a robot could never be worth the same as a person, to which Mari will again demand we play the harmonica, but the general demands that she stop, stating that he isn't her father, and she finally concedes that no, he couldn't be. In fact, who the general is, is a point of curiosity, because towards the final act of the game, automated processes throughout the city will begin to refer to you as Worker 17287, 
And when some of our friends from the army show up in the city, they'll react with outright violence towards us. This confusion compounds the ambiguity of the game to such a degree that I felt that I, as the player, must have done something wrong at some point. It's that notion that brings us to the end of the game, and the fact that Snobby is home to one of the wildest endings I have ever seen in a game. The entire time we've been making our way through Mago City, we've been doing so in pursuit of the elusive Snobby, you know, the guy from the title of the game. And it's here that the game really starts to show its true shape. One of the tower's automated systems reports a single abnormal unit, and it lists that unit as Worker 17287. Shutting down this worker answers, perhaps, a few questions. Unfortunately, it introduces far more. Suddenly, corpses litter the floor, and when asked about it, Mari simply remarks about how our filter must have been turned off, but rather than elaborate, she just says that Sanabi is in the basement. But we don't get far before Major Song, one of our friends from the beginning of the game, makes her appearance and promptly beats the shit out of us, repulsed by the fact that we'd even get near her. It's Mari's pleading alone that forces Song to stay her hand and allow us to journey to the basement, although to be fair, allow is kind of a polite way of explaining it. The elevator descends, we leave Mari behind, and it's here at this point that you get to make a choice. If you go down these stairs, a cutscene will play. You will receive a few shots of incredibly well-animated violence, the game will end, and you will get an achievement for choosing the lie you want to believe. If you go up the stairs, you will enjoy roughly three more hours of gameplay, during which you will receive an answer to every question you could ever ask of the game. Like, this isn't just me, right? You see it too? How this is the most cracked duology of how do you want this story to end options ever put into a game? I think the best part of this is that if you do choose to descend the stairs, upon loading into the game's main menu, you'll even have the chance to reload the game at the point right before you made the call and make the different, obviously correct choice instead, and in doing so, you will get the full story of Sanabi. Ten years ago, our wife was killed. A retaliatory bombing for actions conducted during our time with the military, and that was the end of our career. We had a child at home that needed our attention, a young daughter named Mari. Mari was a smart kid, but more than that, she was observant. There was nothing we could do to truly hide how broken we were after the bombing, after the death, and she thought she might have a solution. In the world of Sanabi, computer programs and personalities are actually rather similar to each other. A person's personality could, in theory, be converted to data, and then elements of that data, such as the loss of a wife, could just be removed. A human's personality could be entirely recorded and edited at will, if you knew what to do with it. The only problem is that in this world, there's basically nothing more illegal than this field of science, so when Mari's actions are leaked, the house is raided, and her father is killed. We've been dead the whole time. And in the aftermath of that raid, only a single thing is taken. The digitized record of our personality. There's not really any investigation to be done, and the trail soon goes cold. But one thing leads to another, and the information for the General's personality eventually makes its way into the hands of the Mago group, who have a very specific plan for it. If the personality of the General could be sufficiently altered, it could be copied and uploaded into any number of robotic bodies, an infinite army made up of obedient broken copies of one of the most dangerous and capable cybernetically enhanced humans to ever live. There was just one problem, because no matter how hard the researchers tried, there was an element of the General's personality, this concept called Tsunabi, that they simply couldn't remove. So they edited it a little bit, and they changed it a tad, and eventually the mysterious Sanabi became a motivating enigma. You could tell the data that Sanabi had done something, and the program would hyper-focus on destroying Sanabi, whatever you had decided it was. One of the key elements of the edits that Mago made was a filter, a thing that would prevent anything running the data from ever seeing humans. In general, at least. The researchers do admit that there's a few pieces of data that you just can't get the program to ignore, people that, in theory, just meant too much to the general during his life. And while that does mean that those people won't get filtered out, the odds of them meeting any of those people must be so small as to be inconsequential to the larger project. This whole idea of digitized, editable, and replicable personalities is an idea remarkably similar to the soul-killer technology from Cyberpunk 2077. 
And it's this element of the game that cements it as an example of the platonic ideal for a cyberpunk story. The notion that in this world, human life can be digitized and commodified. It's not enough that you might lose yourself to cybernetic augments because here in this world, you can be changed without your consent, without your permission, and without you even knowing it. Of course, that's the kind of thing that's also sort of turbo illegal, and that becomes a problem when the information for the Sanabi project gets swiped by some local hackers, and I'll give you a single guess as to who was behind it. When Mago realizes that Mari has got her hands on the data, the corp initiates its failsafe. Overload the nuclear reactor in the city, and kill everyone. The Mago group was willing to sacrifice an entire city of 3 million people just to keep the crimes committed by their board and C-suite executives from coming to light. And it doesn't really get any more dystopic than that. So, what does all of this mean? There's this element to the Lord of the Rings films that I once read, though for the life of me I cannot now find where I read it in regards to the end of Return of the King. Uh, spoilers, I guess, for Return of the King, right at the point where Frodo collapses on the slopes of Mount Doom. The idea is that all nine and a quarter hours, or eleven and one third hours, if you're an extended edition enthusiast, even if they were not good hours, which they undeniably are, would still be hours worth spending on the film just to witness Samwise's defiant cry, the emotional upheaval and the genuine love dripping from every syllable in the sentence, I cannot carry it for you, but I can carry you. The way the music swells and the camera pulls back to show that Sam can, in fact, lift Frodo, and for all of the hate made manifest that the mountain represents, for all of these sharp rocks in Sam's weathered feet, for all of the distance still required to reach their goal, I never doubt that he can, in fact, carry Frodo the whole way. All of that time spent with the films is worth it, just for that emotional payoff. Tsunabi hooked me, with an appeal to a cyberpunk aesthetic, but I realized as it began to reel me in that I was in trouble. I am not a person overly familiar with or particularly fond of platformer games, and Tsunabi is a complex one at that. My last real experience with anything even resembling Tsunabi would have been Super Mario World, a title that I haven't touched for nearing on two decades. So when the game suddenly dropped me at the very beginning of Mago City again and asked that I go through all of the different stages again, I was beginning to feel that Sanabi was overstaying its welcome. The party had ended at midnight and Sanabi was still in my house as I was watching the sun rise. That kind of vibe. And the whole way through, I was just wanting the story to be over. I hadn't gotten as good as I'd hoped at the controls throughout my journey, I found certain elements to be more difficult than I'd have enjoyed, and I'd been trudging through this enigmatic narrative and a movement system that I just couldn't lock down, and I was nearing the 11 and 1 hour mark, and I finally got to the control room for the city's power plant, and Mari had beaten me there. At this point, there's no more mystery. We're not her father, she tells us that much herself, in as firm a voice as she can muster. We're just a fake. A robot that she uploaded a corpse's memory into, and then told that robot that Sanabi was shutting down the plant before it could kill everyone. She doesn't like us. She's never going to like us. And she doesn't want to waste her sorrow on a fake. And then the camera adjusts, and then adjusts again, and we pull out a harmonica, and as we bring it to our mouth, we're given one final flashback. A vision of a core memory. One that could never be taken away, or falsified, of time spent with one of the few people that a filter could never hide. And the moment, the one you've been waiting for, the one I'd desperately been needing, is the reveal that Sanabi is not a bad guy, or a terrorist plot, or the name of a secret corpo project. It is the name of a song, played on the harmonica that one mother, before her death, taught to her daughter, who would then teach it to her father. To us. And suddenly, Worker 17287 is gone. All that remains is one daughter and her father, and the few precious moments that they will get to spend together. This one frame exists as maybe my favorite moment in a game this year, and it's a reminder to me that there is a certain beauty to stories that only really gets to work in an interactive medium. Because this moment didn't just have the emotional payoff of two characters finally getting the reunion they deserved, but rather existed in tandem with my own melancholic joy of having seen this story through to the end. 
I had worked so hard to get to this point through the end of the game, and now that I was here with just a few precious moments to hold my daughter, I could barely handle the fact that this was all I was going to get. Because we were too late. And someone has to shut off the reactor from the inside. And with that much energy and radiation leaking out, it doesn't really make a difference if you're man or machine. That's a one-way trip. With every hello comes a goodbye. This is a cyberpunk story, after all. Valhalla was the natural middle point here. Sanabi had hit me, and it had hit me hard. It was the kind of thing that left me needing a drink. And speaking of segues, Valhalla puts us in the shoes of Jill, a bartender working at the titular Valhalla. Technically, the game and her bar are both called VA-11 Hall A, a naming convention that could only exist in some sort of cyberpunk dystopia mess, but VA-11 Hall A hurts my mouth to say, so we all just call it Valhalla. In the game's own words, Valhalla is a booze -em up a game whose only mechanic is mixing drinks, and despite taking place in a dystopic neon futurescape where corps are kings, your blood is thick with nanomachines, and the local enforcers will have a few minutes to squeeze in a quick beating for someone in the streets in between meetups to take their cuts from local gangs, Valhalla is not interested in giving you interaction with those systems or events. It's only interested in giving you interactions with the people affected by those systems and events. Honestly, Valhalla has more in common with a book than a game. A sort of novel, maybe, just with more visuals. Oh hey, look at that. This means that there's not really a lot for me to show off when it comes to gameplay. I could sit here and mix drinks for you for a while, I guess, but I have this sneaking suspicion that this kills the viewer retention, so instead, I'm going to tell you some stories. The first story is one that hits particularly close to home because it's a story of Jill and her co-workers. Truthfully, it is the story of Valhalla itself. The only thing that really establishes Valhalla as an important setting is that you happen to work there. There is no major plot to the game, no fixers hanging in the shadows, no mercs trying to make legends of themselves, just three people trying to make a living and keep the doors open. Gil is a really fun place to start here, because he exists as a sort of microcosm for the game as a whole. You start the game knowing very little about who he actually is, and throughout the story, you really only learn things about Gil that he wants you to know, which is to say, very little. The implications around Gil are very deep, and you can piece together in no small way that outside this game, he has a very big story. That in some other game, there is an intricate narrative weaving around a chaotic life, a life that occasionally still pokes through his bartender aesthetic that he currently wears, and that game ends with his arrival to Valhalla. Never intending to fully put down roots here, but just needing a place that can give him some stability for a few months. And that stability is exactly what Dana, Valhalla's owner, is capable of. Dana, much like Gil, has a pretty expansive past, and it's one you'll only get a handful of details on. There's no shortage of references to her past, she quite literally wears one on her sleeve in the form of a cybernetic arm, but good luck getting any information on that, as she insists that it's more interesting if it stays a mystery. But she'll mention her time spent working for an underground fighting ring under the alias of the Red Comet, and her time spent with the Neo San Fran police force after that ring got busted. With that behind her, she settled into her role as the manager of Valhalla, and it was this previous experience, I think, that gave her empathy towards Gil when he first appeared in the doorway. Disheveled, clearly in trouble, and just needing a place to lay low for a little while. And because there's nothing more permanent than a temporary fix, he just stayed around, working under the credentials of a previous employee. It's this sort of interpersonal kindness that I think a good cyberpunk world and story sort of requires. The cyberpunk world is one with a lot of brutality inherent to its characterizations, both from systems and from strangers, designed to present the world as a dystopia. But the thing about telling a dystopic story is that people tend to drop out of them pretty quick if the only thing we get out of them is that brutality. And so in games like Valhalla, having a close-knit group of people that cares about each other, even if they're not wildly close with each other, is exactly the vibe needed to keep a player invested in the story. This sense of care and stability required to make cyberpunk worlds palatable is something that I think shines with Jill, our surrogate into this world, and one of two characters that we really get information on and investment into, because she makes up one half of the most important story, 
which we will get to. The start of the game places you alone in an empty apartment, just yourself and your cat, Four. But every day, the game will inform you that Jill has been thinking about one thing or another, and by buying an item related to that thing at the shops, you can keep her from getting distracted at work, thereby keeping the drink-mixing mechanic from getting confusing by preventing Jill from forgetting people's orders. But more importantly than that is the fact that these items physically appear in Jill's apartment as we play, and over the course of the story, you'll be able to watch as this empty apartment turns into a well-loved and lived-in home, giving that same sense of stability and set roots that cyberpunk stories require. This is also where the main interactivity of the game shows itself. There are three different stages of the game, each broken up and defined by an amount of money that Jill will need to pay to maintain access to certain services, like her electricity or rent. So you'll need money for these things, but you'll also need money to keep her from getting distracted, because her being distracted makes it harder to serve drinks correctly, and serving the wrong drinks means you don't get any money, so... Uh, don't fuck up. Speaking of not fucking up, I am fully aware that even though I am in no way a music guy, sideways please come back, I cannot do this, I am not strong enough, if I do not talk about this game's soundtrack, every single comment on this video is just going to be, hey idiot, why didn't you talk about this game's soundtrack? The sound of cyberpunk is pretty well defined at this point. It is synth heavy and bass forward, though that can be played in reverse, and in the case of 2077, typically comes with a certain sense of roughness to it, some element of grunge. In the case of Valhalla, however, the majority of those rough edges have been smoothed down, and the result is a sound that is undeniably and unmistakably cyberpunk, but in the kind of way that someone could make a lo-fi playlist with it. A playlist that I might literally be listening to as I edit this video. As long as said playlist excludes Base of the Titans, which is a soundscape far more akin to Doom Eternal and the ripping and tearing therein than that of our Neon Towers. These smoother edges also inform a great deal about what this game's tone is. Valhalla's OST is remarkably easy to listen to, and that's the point. Valhalla wants you to come inside, it wants you to be comfortable, it wants to be an escape from things more abrasive. And I think the player will naturally feel this, as at the start of every day, it is your job to build a playlist on the jukebox using the different individual songs within the game. Day 1 is December 13th, and our boss Dana arrives to work with an incapacitated woman in tow, making this the rare instance where a person enters the bar unconscious. It's also a nice change of pace, because it means all of the vomit is on the outside this time. Probably. Dana finds a spot for her in the corner booth and makes the call that this mystery gal gets to sleep her problems off here. It doesn't benefit Dana to save this woman, and it won't solve any of my problems to keep an eye on her while she sleeps, but it's still the right thing to do, and in a place like Glitch City, or any other neon-lit megacity, that's not something you can trust the world to do for you. And that's why when our Jane Doe wakes up, it's pretty much just panic on her end, ranging from the genuine belief that she's dead when she's told she's arrived to Valhalla, all the way to thinking that she's about to be dead after we harvest her organs. But that's some scav-type shit, and quite frankly, I could never. Over the course of the evening, as she calms down and realizes that she is, in fact, not dead, nor in trouble, you'll get to have a real conversation, and this is the place to highlight the game's main strength, its dialogue. There's an interesting bit to game design, I think, wherein the more elements a game has, the less the polish on any individual element matters. If 49 of the 50 things a game does are done well, that one being unpolished isn't too big a deal. But a game like Valhalla is 95% dialogue and writing, which means that if that element is bad, the game is too. I think the best thing I can say for Valhalla is that when I was young, I was one of those kids that would rip and tear through books at the local library, the sort of child that got a comical amount of fun out of reading through a new story as fast as I could, and Valhalla, for the 14 or so hours I spent with it, took me back to that. Pretty much every time I ended an in-game day and stopped my recording, I would be shocked to find that 45 minutes had passed since I'd started, and even though all I really was doing was reading, I look back on Valhalla as one of the most pleasant games I've played in a long time, and it's due basically in full to the game's writing and the character's dialogue. After calming her down, our mystery lady introduces herself as Kim, and tells us about her life, her job, her boss, how much she despises it all. She doesn't talk about the specifics of why she's so miserable, but she does want to know what it's like to be a bartender, and if it was always a dream of ours. 
But Jill's never really had a dream job. Bartending was just a thing that she fell into, and she views the notion of a dream job as something that the world unfairly presents the idea of. Sometimes stuff just happens. Sometimes stuff doesn't work out. Kim says that maybe Jill's right, and maybe that's okay. She thanks you for the drink, and Dana for her help, and then she's gone. Except, in my case, she returned around a week later, and over a few drinks, she told me a new story of how she finally got fed up with her old job, how desperate she got for a change, and how that led her to quit on the spot with no plan or backup. And even though her family was terrified, it was the first time in a long time where she could finally breathe. And that makes all of the instability worth it. This is the typical pacing of the game. Different characters coming and going, telling you their stories, and building out the world and setting of Glitch City from within the walls of Valhalla. And these experiences have an incredible amount of range, from characters like Kim, with simple stories about pursuing your own dreams, to characters like Alma, who grow to be incredibly close friends with Jill and show an incredible amount of trust in that relationship. The most important character, though, I think, is Gabby. Gabby is the younger sister of Lenore, who, depending on the way you interpret these kinds of things, either is or was Jill's girlfriend. The context here is that when Jill was younger, she was an exceptionally good student, even without applying effort, and that continued into college, even if she actually had to try now. In college is where she met Lenore, who was a student in the same major, and they grew closer and closer until a relationship formed. As her time in college went on, however, Jill began to worry that her life was becoming too decided too quick, and began to second-guess everything about it. And when graduation came, and she got an offer for a prestigious job in a field she was doubting, she panicked at the idea of waking up in 40 years and realizing that she'd never had any actual freedom in the choices she was making. She made the call to decline the job, but then Lenore accepted it on her behalf, because she couldn't understand why Jill wouldn't want to follow through with what would have been Lenore's dream. It went downhill from there pretty fast, and at the peak of their fighting, Jill stormed out. That was the last time they ever saw each other, and for three years, Jill has just sat in limbo, knowing that she should reach out, she should apologize, but never doing so out of the nebulous fear of whatever Lenore's response might be. Gabby is not here to tell us that Lenore hates us, or that she wants to make amends. She's here to tell us that Lenore is dead. In that moment, everything kind of collapses in on itself for Jill. There's this recognition that all of the guilt and regret over their fight can never be fulfilled now. There's no apology that matters. For no real reason, Jill waited, and now... It's just too late to do anything. It is at this point that we must address the incredible brilliance of Valhalla as a game. Because in Jill's grief-stricken state, the whole being a good bartender thing we're supposed to be doing is sort of falling apart. And so our good friend and regular client Alma politely but firmly places us on the bar stool, and she herself takes a spin at being the bartender, herself taking on the role of the character designed to receive the stories of troubled people. But what's incredible is that the camera angle doesn't change. We actually get to see Jill, the character, as she would see herself from her position behind the counter, and suddenly, I realized we're not actually playing through this game as Jill, we're playing through it as the archetypal role of the cyberpunk bartender, which is currently being filled by Alma. Valhalla is essentially just Cyberpunk 2077 if Claire was the main character. Seriously, she'd still be working at the afterlife even, if you think about it. In fact, that sort of tone crossover makes a whole lot of sense, and it isn't just a thing I recognize, because the people behind Cyberpunk Red, the TTRPG attached to Cyberpunk 2077, have created a supplement featuring the cast and crew of Valhalla. While we're on this note, I think it's worth mentioning that Cyberpunk is a genre with a great deal of inherent crossover potential, because the core themes are always so consistent. So long as the towers are glowing and the corpse are corping, so long as that dystopia is there, you can basically drop any character from any cyberpunk story into a different one, and it'll still make sense. This conversation with Gabby is sort of the determiner of before and after for this game. Everything in the game so far has been leading to it, and everything after it lives within its shadow. The culmination of this event is signaled when Jill gets a letter from Gabby asking if they can talk a second time. Doing so will essentially fulfill the main emotional throughline of the story. The first day of Valhalla sees Jill receiving a delivery, a letter to be specific that she doesn't open because it's from Lenore. But with Gabby here, it's finally time to open the letter, and all it says is sorry. 
which is exactly like Lenore to do. I can't tell you, word for word, the conversation that follows between these two, but I can tell you that over the next 14 minutes I was treated to writing with the highest level of heartfelt connection and genuine care. Emotions created and fostered by the shared love of a person no longer here. Three years of regret and blame and guilt melt away in the warmth and the bright light of the realization that now is the time to be better, and I really believe that they will be. At the end of all things, Valhalla isn't really a game about dealing with the consequences of living in a cyberpunk dystopia. It's a game about sitting sideline to other people and their struggles, coming to terms with your own, and recognizing that your station in this world is not to save the day, or overthrow a corporation, it's to mix drinks and change lives. It is uncommon for me to play a game and to feel genuine relief by the time it is over, because that means I don't have to play that game anymore. It is far more uncommon still for me to include that game in a video on my channel, but Anno Mutationum has forced my hand in the most disagreeable way by being among the greatest examples of why understanding themes and genres matter when making art and telling stories, and how misusing them can lead to a baffling final product. Because the problem with Anno Mutationum is not that Anno isn't a good cyberpunk game, it's that Anno is not a cyberpunk game. Let me cook for a second. Anno opens, quite literally, with a bang as we cut from low Earth orbit to side seat with three missiles. These missiles do whatever this is, and we cut high again to show their path as they scream towards some sort of crater or crater-adjacent anomaly. All three missiles hit, and the whole sky instantly goes alight with a massive fireball only to hard cut to a viewing room, highlighting the event as a failure, making me utterly terrified of what success could have possibly been in this scenario. Cut again to one of our viewers writing up a massive lift, and then to a presentation before some sort of Shadow Council board of directors and also their cat, who seem aggressively disappointed in our viewer as they reject… something. We then hard cut again to a new scene as a character, a young girl maybe, wakes up in a pile of what I thought might have been ashes from a massive explosion perhaps, but is revealed to be just snow. One more hard cut, with a few frames of something in between, and we awake in our bed, implying that some element of what we just saw was a dream. We accept a package for one Anne Flores, who will be our surrogate into this world, and we open it, revealing the contents to be a small robotic companion who projects a hologram of our friend Ayane, who will be our sidekick for the duration of this experience. Speaking of this experience, Anno is a game that I recognize as split in twain, as two fundamentally different experiences, and we're going to cut through this first half pretty quick because most of what I want to say is centered around that breakpoint and the game that comes after it. If you happen to check your computer at the start of the game, you'll have the chance to read through a handful of emails, and I do love the way the game does this because three of these messages will quickly and concisely detail the three largest themes of the first half of this game. We have a doctor, named Alan, that we're working with to understand some kind of illness. We have a father pressuring us to ask this doctor about something called N540, a sort of theorized cure for our illness, though it's hard to see it as more than a rumor, and we have a brother named Ryan who's been missing for some time now. These three things make up the core plot of the first half of the game, side quests aside. We visit the doctor to engage in a little combat tutorial and learn more about Anne's illness, a disease called entangleitis, which seems to be something akin to an unexpectable but always timely temporary paralysis analog. After that, it's off to see the family. We have a book to deliver to our father, and our sister needs help running the bar. Yes, that kind of bar, making this the second game in tonight's programming to include a drink mixer minigame, and speaking of crossovers, you'll never guess who shows up to help at the bar while you're out doing adventure stuff. Hello Jill Cyberpunk, very cool to see you again, tell your boss Dana hi for me, just kidding, I'll do it myself. It's after our first shift at the bar that the plot starts in earnest, when some gangers show up demanding to know where Ryan is. They're easy enough to beat the shit out of, mainly because we brought a bionic laser sword to a these goons don't have a bionic laser sword fight, but the event comes with a recognition that Ryan is not just missing, he's being hunted. He took something from these gangers' boss, but what that something is, isn't clear. Checking in with Robopop, and we learn that the last anyone saw of or heard from Ryan was that he was on the trail of something that could cure our entangleitis. 
The best place to start is in the city of Noctis, where Robo Dad used to have a bachelor pad because it's possible that Ryan is holed up there. He's not there, of course, because this would be a weird place for the credits to roll, but it is, however, a great place for a title card. There's not much in the pad of value, but we do know that Ryan was here and he left behind a damaged ROM. If we can get it repaired, it might be our next clue to follow, unless we get tased and sit on the ground just long enough to have it stolen from us. Terrible luck, really. Thankfully, these goons still don't have bionic laser swords, so they're in easy cleanup, and the hunt is on. If I had to pinpoint Anno's greatest strength, I think it would be this right here. Half 2D platformer, half hack and slash, all set in the glow of a neon city as the backdrop. Unfortunately, we're barely two hours in and already peaking. The chase concludes with a sword versus mech fight on the top of this warehouse which collapses under the weight of our incredible sword-based prowess. The aftermath of that collapse gives us both a new sword and a chance to use it, as Loki, the guy piloting this mech, is unaware of the fact that they've already been beaten. It is at this moment that our only strikes when the plot demands its sickness incapacitates us, and Loki makes his escape. Ayane does some digging, and we're able to find a club in Noctis where we might be able to get a new lead, and I want to take this chance to give praise bordering on worship to the details present in this city, because Noctis really is sort of the platonic ideal of what I personally consider the perfect cyberpunk locale to be. Noctis ranges from grungy back alleys to brightly lit neon squares to loud bombastic hologram concerts, each section carefully designed to represent some element of the cyberpunk city while also not feeling like the map is just broken up into different areas with separate themes. There is a reason, I think, that the game is marketed so heavily around the Noctis appearance, why the game's opening menu is set here, because despite this area making up an incredibly small amount of the total playtime, this is what people like me are looking for when we want to engage with a cyberpunk experience. I just wish the game had pulled it off. I'm going to level with you. I'm going to cut through a lot of in-between elements to this story, partially because it's almost 10pm, like 5 or 6 days before you're watching this video, and I kind of need to move quick, but more so because, with the benefit of hindsight, not a lot of what I could tell you here is actually going to matter to the story. All that really matters is that we get our lead, we head to the tunnels under the old interstate, we find some journals left behind by Ryan, and we learn that he's missing because he's on a wild goose chase trying to find N540 so that he can cure us. Don't let that briefness deceive you, a lot happens in these tunnels. <sighs> There's a few places where Entangleitis hits and we get flashes to a new place, and at one point we do a sword fight with a mystery man, where even though we win, it goes to a cutscene where we're losing so that we can get another flash to a mystery place and something wired to a pillar gives us the power to sword fight this guy again, and we win again, except this time I am so tired. A masked lady tells us that the mystery place is called Hinterland, and it's a parallel world to our own that our mind has access to, but we can't let it deceive us, but she doesn't say what it is, I just want to go to sleep, and the whole time this is happening, we're also getting cutaways to the mystery people from the start of the game, talking about things we don't have context for, and more and more of the game is heading towards the funny zone, and I'm getting this sinking suspicion that something is going wrong with this story. On our way out of the tunnels, we find a child. And we take her to the family home so that she can sleep off her child in a place a child has no business being condition and go about our way, continuing to look for Ryan, until we get a call from Dad where he says, hey, did you see my text? And the text is a four minute video where the child we found has woken up and magically summons Santa Claus. That's not a joke, that's what happens. That's, that's one of the events of the game. It is important to note, I think, that I have a handful of guidelines for making a video. I try not to spoil the game for myself if it's a game I haven't played. I try not to read too many reviews or watch other essays on a thing I haven't experienced myself yet. I want the chance to understand this thing for myself, but it was this moment where all of that got put on pause. I don't like not understanding things. That's sort of its own obsession of mine. The kind of thing that drove me to play 200 hours of Elden Ring and make a 90 minute story about my experience with it even though I don't much care for the game. I didn't understand what people were seeing with Elden Ring, I didn't understand why I was missing it, and I couldn't get past that. And it was at this moment with Anno where I realized I did not understand this game. So jarring was this small child casting a magic spell to summon Santa Claus in my cyberpunk adventure that I simply had to understand what I was missing. So I caved, and I read through some reviews, and I want to share with you the one that really stood out to me, because I found this. And this is where my frustrations began. Anno is not a cyberpunk game. It is an SCP Foundation fan game that happens to use a cyberpunk veneer for the first half of its story. 
That veneer is what pulled my attention, but as I continued the story and got deeper and deeper, more and more of the game started falling apart on me as the game revealed its true form. For the uninitiated, SCP stands for Secure, Contain, Protect. It is the title of what is potentially the world's greatest community writing project. Each entry into the SCP Foundation is an article written by a member of the community detailing some form of anomalous thing. It could be a statue that snaps your neck if you're not looking at it, it could be a weird monster that kills you if you see a photo of it, it could be a lizard that's remarkably hard to destroy. There are, quite literally, thousands of these articles, each one detailing an anomaly and the Foundation's effort to keep those anomalies contained and controlled. And, and look, I know I'm doing a bad job of my job, of being the guy on your second monitor who explains games and analyzes what they're doing and why those things matter, but honestly, by the end of this game, I was so confused on every element of what I was seeing and experiencing, and the issue with that is that the frustration that came from that wasn't that I felt that I had missed something the game was trying to tell me, it didn't feel like tones or themes were going over my head, it felt like every time something happened, every time an element was introduced and I didn't get it, my brain defaulted to, oh, I wonder what SCP this is a reference to. I didn't have the chance to get it, I didn't have the opportunity to understand it because I wasn't familiar with the one out of 9,000 or so articles from the SCP wiki. The other problem is that those articles are insanely well written. Each article is approved or denied by the community itself, and after so long a time, that community has an absolute stranglehold on the style and quality it uses, which means that anything that attempts to mimic that style that doesn't stick the landing sticks out like a sore thumb. I don't know a lot about SCP, but I can tell you, with a non-insignificant amount of certainty, that I would not classify it as cyberpunk. To me, Anno feels like an exploration of the combination of what I would consider to be two incompatible world designs and narrative styles. The core ethos of these two genres are just too dissimilar to be mixed readily, but I fully concede and have probably said at some point in the past that if you're good at what you're doing, you can do it however you want. The question just boils down to, are you good enough at what you're doing? There's this video by my personal favorite essayist breadsword called The Adventures of Tintin and the Shadows of Giants. If you're unfamiliar with their work, please become familiar with their work. You'll probably recognize bits of my voice and editing style in their work, and that's because they're one of my greatest sources of inspiration. In this video, Breadzord talks about the history of Tintin, why this film adaptation succeeds, why others fell short, and also the World of Warcraft movie, I promise it makes sense in context. The basic idea is that the director of the Warcraft movie was a die-hard fan of the games and the universe, and so when he undertook the efforts to turn those things into a film, he just couldn't help including all of the things he knew fans of the game would want to see because they were things he would want to see. But in doing so, he failed to build his own world, his own story, his own anything. And so rather than add to a narrative and stand on the shoulders of this giant, he stood in the shadows and didn't really add much at all. This is contrasted to the modern Tintin, which is a story unique to itself that openly acknowledges all of the things that came before it, but insists on its own footing, its own story, its own existence, standing atop what came before it and adding to its height. The Tintin movie succeeds because it is standing on the shoulders of what came before it, wholly its own thing, while never putting itself too distant from its origins and sources. The Warcraft movie fails because every aspect of its being is inherently and intrinsically tied to its source material, meaning that if you're familiar with the source material, you might enjoy the easter eggs, but if you're not, it's just a movie that doesn't make much sense. Anno stands very deeply in the darkest part of the shadow cast by the SCP project, never managing to climb or stand atop it. So much of this game felt like the writers poking and prodding, each one prompting a response about how cool is it that they've read so many SCP articles, and maybe that is cool if you're equally familiar, but if you're me, who's only familiar with like a dozen, and you just wanted to explore a cyberpunk game because everything about this game was advertised as cyberpunk, you're just going to be frustrated. And I think the biggest part of that frustration is knowing that SCP Overlord exists. Overlord is a short film in a collection of SCP-styled films posted to the Evan Royalty YouTube channel that, in short, details a mobile task force responding to an anomalous event, very standard SCP format. It is, to put it plainly, 
34 minutes of some of the best horror content ever put to YouTube, and what's so good about it is that you don't even need to be familiar with SCP as a concept to enjoy it. The anomaly the team is sent to investigate isn't even a proper article. People debate where the inspiration could have come from, but the exact anomaly from the film is not from a registered SCP article. But that also means that if you are familiar with SCP, you will see so much of the project you love represented here. With something like Overlord, it's clear that you can make an SCP story without needing to showcase you know about Dr. Bright's weird necklace. I've completely lost the plot here, haven't I? Anomutationum is an exploration of themes and how to use them improperly. It advertises itself as a cyberpunk story, it plays like an SCP story, and fundamentally falls short of the potential of either and misses the ability to blend those two elements. As a result, I feel like the game that I bought is not the game that I got, and all I really got out of this is a deeper appreciation for games and stories that nail the cyberpunk aesthetic and tone. Because I thought for a bit, once this game started to deviate, that it would be okay. That the lights and the veneer of Noctis would be enough to keep me engaged, that the cyberpunk design would be enough, that my time as a bionic laser sword wielding street samurai would fulfill me, but what I realized is that I was wrong. Without the proper tone, without a story to match the world, without the proper usage of the themes expected from a cyberpunk story, the design and aesthetic just didn't make sense anymore when used the way they are here. I don't know how to end this bit. I've never not liked a game like this before. Maybe I'm just not the target audience for Anno, but I can't help but feel like the game showcases itself as if it was made for someone like me. I mean, in the planning stage of this video, I specifically saved this game for last because I thought it would be the strongest contender, the one most closely aligned to the elements that I fell in love with from Cyberpunk 2077, but they just weren't here. Sanabi showed me that the proper use of cyberpunk as a genre will keep me invested in a mechanical style of gameplay that I might not otherwise be interested in, and that so long as the ending sticks the landing, I will feel fulfilled. Valhalla gave me a new perspective on the cyberpunk world and the ways that the characters I control and play as can inhabit them. Cyberpunk is a genre for me wherein the station of my character in the world is largely irrelevant to my enjoyment of the world. If the form and function are both correct, I will enjoy it. Anomutationum is a lesson that both form and function are required. The aesthetic of cyberpunk and the story of cyberpunk are pretty firmly linked together, and trying to have one without the other often leaves either half as lesser. Something out there, some story, has probably nailed a way to use one without the other, but I don't think it was this one. Cyberpunk remains an obsession of mine. The world design and story elements key to this genre remain the most moving, the most invigorating, the most enjoyable for me to explore. The neon glow of a city that hates me remains the foundation of my work here, and it will continue to show from time to time when appropriate. But for now, it's time to explore something different. Ugh, this was supposed to be easy, you know? This was supposed to be a quick video, three small games, a 20 minute adventure in and out, but God has cursed me for my hubris and my work is never done. If you're still here, I want to say thank you. These bigger videos always feel like a bit of a risk, because if people don't connect with them, they're like double the effort in the same amount of time to make, so if you're here all the way at the end, I want you to know that that means a lot to me. Cyberpunk as a genre and a concept is something that really is a big deal. This channel, my dream, is sort of built on top of it, and I'll take pretty much any excuse I can find to talk about it. And I like to think that I understand it more now, and I really like that. As always, this is where I get the chance to thank my funders on Patreon for their incredible support of myself and my channel, with an extra special thank you to my executive funder, DaddyBiscuit22, for their incredibly generous pledge. If you want to know more about the benefits for supporting this channel, or just help me out with keeping the lights on, then consider making the jump to my Patreon page and seeing if there's a spot for you there. Thank you.